Welcome to our STEM speaker series, which is the fourth Tuesday at 11, 10, and 5 p.m. during the months of October, November, February, March, and April. Upcoming spring semester, in February, there'll be a talk on the art, science, and medicinal uses of chocolate. In April, there'll be a talk by Dr. Steve Aquilani of DCCC on ecology, and in April, I'll be giving a talk on mathematical magic. So those are the talks coming up in the spring. You're welcome to attend them. Let me introduce our speaker. Paula Clifford is the executive director of the Pennsylvania Society for Biomedical Research where she is responsible for the vision and oversight of this statewide organization. Her primary goal is to educate the public about biomedical research and the role of animals in that research. Before any discovery can be tested in human beings, there's a critical stage involving animals to determine if the discovery is safe and effective. Biomedical research involves a demanding path of science and discovery that often leads to new treatments and cures, both for people and for animals. It is only through research with animals that science were first, scientists were first able to develop a treatment for respiratory distress syndrome in premature babies, a vaccine for rabies in dogs, and it is only through the continuation of biomedical research that future drugs and medical devices can truly save lives. So Paula's talk will highlight the value of biomedical research and the role of animals in that research. The topics will include the type of animals needed, regulations protecting laboratory animals, we do want to protect them, and care, and, um, and care provided to ensure high quality of animal welfare. Paula has a Master of Arts degree from UPenn, a BA in Biology from Rutgers in New Jersey, and an AS degree, so she has attended community college from Camden County College. She's won a number of awards, but that would take the whole hour <laughs> delineating them. She's given many formal presentations, and she's published many articles on animal research. So I'm quite honored to have Paula Clifford give the talk this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paula Clifford. Great. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so we're going to talk about biomedical research and the role of animals, but just want to pause for one second for a quick sound check. Does that sound okay? Okay, great. Um, okay, so before we go any further, I'm curious on how relevant this topic is to each of you in this room. So I just want to check, check um, just ask you a couple questions. So how many of you are in a, in a degree, you're looking, you're in health sciences, science, medical, that kind of uh, degree. So almost everybody, but not everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. If you guys could um, sort of just put your hand up like this. You don't have to put it all the way up, but just put it up like this, because I wanna see um, if, one, if you can answer yes to one of these questions, I'd like you to just put your hand down, okay? So if everybody could sort of put your hand up. Um, have you ever had surgery? Have you ever taken a prescription pain medicine? So medicine that your doctor had to prescribe. Okay. Have you ever taken an antibiotic? All right. Put your hand down if you answered yes. Oh. Um, and, oh, everybody's hands down. Okay. So, whether you're in a science degree, pursuing a science degree, or if you put your hand down, this talk is, exact, is, is relevant to you, and the reason is, without biomedical research and the role of animals, those, those questions that I just asked you about surgery, pain medicine, wouldn't, we wouldn't even have that today. 
So, um, so we're going to talk more about it. This is your opportunity to ask me as many questions as you have about the role of animals in biomedical research. I, I worked in biomedical research as a veterinary nurse. Um, I then focused most of my career while I was at University of Pennsylvania working with the research animals in training. Um, it's required for anybody who's going to care for or need animals and research to be trained and I, that was a big part of what I did. Um, and now I just educate people like you about what really happens in research. We're going to get started. Um, you heard a little bit about PSBR. I'm not going to go through this, but just so you know, we're all over the state. We cover our region and we, we go out and we talk to schools, um, colleges, K-12 through classrooms. We go to conferences and we also monitor legislation to make sure that we don't get anything passed that's going to prevent us um, to be able to, to conduct biomedical research as we know it today. Okay, um, so first I'm going to talk about the types of animals that are used in research. So um, can anybody tell me what the most common animal used in research is? You guys are on top of it. Okay, that's not usually what I hear, but yeah, exactly. So it's actually mice and rats together make up 95% of all animals used in research. Um, and, and that includes some of the other rodents as well, guinea pigs, hamsters, but mostly mice and rats. Um, and here, this is just a screen to tell you some of the other vertebrate animals that are used in research. So you can see mice and rats are our, our number one group. But we also use, you know, they're not models for everything. Um, and I can't go through every model for every disease, but sometimes mice and rats can help us get, where, get us where we need to be. Um, less than 0.5% of the animals used in research are dogs and cats. And then less than 0.2% of the animals in research are non-human primates. And then we have all these other animals like uh, pigs and zebrafish, ferrets, rabbits, um, and as well as many, many others. So um, as we go through this talk, if you have, and when we get to the question and answer period, if you have a question about a specific animal that might be needed, uh, feel free to ask me about it at that time. But I think in a, in a few years, probably the new mouse, is uh, the zebrafish is going to be the new mouse because we're learning a lot from zebrafish. Um, what do we have in common with the zebrafish, would you say? And the clue's sort of up there on the slide. We're vertebrates, right? There, we are so similar to these guys because of that simple fact. So, um, uh, and they do, they do some things that we don't do. So, for example, a zebrafish, um, you know, we have coronary arteries on our hearts, and that feeds the heart muscle, right? So, um, in a zebrafish, if that coronary, coronary artery gets damaged, it grows back. Wouldn't it be great if we could figure out how to get a human coronary artery to uh, grow back? So, sometimes what's different about us also helps us develop cures and treatments. Okay, and, and this, is, uh, this is a graph just to show you sort of the change in the, in the types of animals used in research over time. So for some of you, it might have surprised you that mice and rats are the most common. Some of you, um, a lot of times when I ask audiences that question, they'll say dogs, monkeys, those kinds of things that you usually see when you're doing an internet search on animal research. But in fact, they're, they're very, you can see they're, they're the lowest numbers here. So, um, you know, people think about rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, and these animals were all more used in the past. But over time, it's decreasing. You can see this graph only goes into uh, the year 2000. If, if, if it was extended out to now, you would see those trends continuing to decrease. Um, a couple things here. You can see that primates and cats are, have stayed pretty stable, and that's because we just don't use that many of them um, anyway. Um, and then dogs have significantly decreased. So what do you think might have happened in 1985 to, to cause this sort of sharp decline? Any ideas? What do you think? What's that, PETA? Great, yeah, so public pressure. Um, so in 1985, uh, because of public pressure, the Animal Welfare Act, which is a law that protects animals used in research, uh, was hot, heavily amended. So that law was first passed in 1966, but in 1985, it was heavily amended. And one of the things that the law says is that you needed to use, um, you know, you had to justify the animal numbers. So you had to use the least number that you needed. Um, it also said a whole bunch of other things, which we'll talk about in a later slide when we talk about the regulations. Um, but it said that you needed to use um, the, the animal that was sort of lower on the phylogenetic sort of order of things, okay? 
So um, it, instead of using a non-human primate, you were needed to you needed to use something like maybe a fruit fly. And if that wasn't going to work, go up up the scale until you got a model that was going to work, like a mouse or something like that. So yeah. Now, do you think the advancement in technology has anything to do with the the um, decrease in those numbers? Yeah, big time, right? So, um, well, you know, lots and lots and lots of advances in technology. So another thing that the, the law says is that we must use alternatives to animals when possible. So if you can get your data without using an animal, you're not allowed to use an animal. Okay, so that was something that law said. So a uh, lots of alternatives because of the law change and because of public pressure and because it's much less expensive and because um, any scientist that you talk to is going to prefer to use an alternative rather than an animal, those things have started to be developed. Um, plus mice, um, you can actually now, uh, you can develop mice as models for specific diseases. So there's transgenic mice where you can actually create mice that model cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, you know, anything that you're studying and that's going to be a much better model than just a, you know, regular purpose-bred dog. So, um, so thinking about the numbers, you know, people, you know, one of the questions that people ask me is how many are you using, how many of these animals are you using in research? Um, and this just puts it in perspective a little bit. So 93% of the rats and mice uh, raised in this country are raised actually for food, for zoo animals or pets. Um, and five percent of the animals raised are for, or rodents raised, are, are raised for laboratory research. So um, the other thing I like to share with audiences is that the animals used in research are purposely bred for research. So um, you know they're not taken from shelters or you know bought from the pet store. They're purposely they're they're, they're companies that breed animals just for research, um, and it's science, right? So. One of the most important things in science is controlling your variables, okay? So one of the, the, the good things about having these animals that are purposely bred from research is we know their complete history, right? From birth until you get them, you know their genetic profile, they're healthy, it's very important that they're healthy. If you're having using animals in research that are not healthy, what's that gonna do to your data, right? So um, that goes for, for, for the animals that we use. Um, uh, let's the next slide. Okay, uh, one of my pictures didn't come up, but but too bad. You guys are probably wondering why I put that up, that picture up. But the picture before it was actually a radiograph, you know, and it and it shows the um, that that snake eating that that mouse. Okay, so this is um, this is something you may or may not have heard, but but because of those questions I asked you earlier. Uh, you probably would agree with this. Animal research has played a vital role in virtually every major medical advancement of the last century. Uh, I actually have a poster in my office, and you're, you're free to have it if you want. Just go to uh, our website, and um, I can mail it over to you. But it's a poster of uh, scientists that have won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology from 1901 all the way till today. And what it does is it lists that scientist that, that won the prize, and then it lists the animal that was needed to make their contribution. So it's really great to take a look at that to see how much animals have been integrated into um, medicine and, and, and society. So what I want to do is I just want to share a couple of my favorite stories um, on, on what biomedical research in the role of animals has provided for us today. Has anybody, can anybody tell me what that is? Iron lungs, exactly, yeah. Do you know what disease that was used, they were used in prevalently back in the 1950s, 1915 to 1945? What's that? Polio. Nice. Yeah. So um, yeah. So back from from probably around 1915 to 1945, we had a polio epidemic. Um, it was just a horrific, horrific epidemic. I mean. Babies and kids, you know, and people, but you know, kids would come into the hospital with the fever and maybe a little bit of stiff neck, and within a few hours, many of them were dead. Um, if they survived, they were they were crippled for life. Um, so these iron lungs, what polio does is it actually causes paralysis. So once your diaphragm get, gets paralyzed, what can you not do? Right. So these iron lungs were, were uh, developed so that the thought was 
you know, put, put these uh, polio infected uh, people with the paralysis into the, and most of these were children's, children and babies, although a lot of adults also got infected. Um, you know, put them in the iron lungs so they could artificially breathe until the virus could run its course and hopefully they would survive and be able to, um, you know, live a normal life. Unfortunately, a lot died and, and, and many um, were crippled. In fact, I think at the peak of the polio epidemic, half a million people died every year um, worldwide uh, from this disease. Uh, but thanks to um, mice, monkeys, and some scientists, we have the polio vaccine. Right? So has anybody in this room had polio? Hopefully not, right? Um, and that's true for all the other vaccines that we get. So, um, and think about what's going on today with the obo obo Ebola. I mean, there is still no you know, vaccine or, or, or FDA approved vaccine or treatment that will prevent or get rid of the disease. We know that some people survive it, some people die from it, and it's scary. You know what I mean? So we really need those animals and biomedical research and those scientists to help us get, get through this. So that's one of my favorites because it's made a big difference. And this is my other one. Um, how many of you know somebody or have experienced a premature birth? It could be very devastating for, for a family. Um, so back in, uh, I guess it was probably the 1950s, about 10,000 premature babies born every year were born gasping for breath and then would die. Um, another 15,000 babies born every year, also that premature, gasping for breath, would mysteriously recover. So what do you think might have been causing that? Eight weeks premature, gasping for breath. Right, so, so the lungs are, are, are one of the last organs to, to mature before you're born, okay? And if you remember, you know, those of you who have had anatomy and physiology, it's all coming back to you now probably. Uh, one of the things a, a mature lung does is it secretes something called surfactant. It's like this soapy, bubbly substance. And it keeps those tiny little air sacs open called alveoli so that gas exchange can happen, right? Um, if, if the lung is not mature, no surfactant, alveoli could collapse, baby can't breathe. But if that baby could live long enough for that lung to mature, surfactant would be secreted, alveoli stayed open, they could breathe. Um, this was called infant respiratory Dis distress syndrome and it occurred in babies born more than eight weeks early. In 1972, it was shown that premature rabbits given surfactant therapy could breathe um, and it, it was beneficial. So, so these guys were involved in this research and so were sheep. So this is one of those cases where we needed animals other than, than ro rodents. It wasn't until 1985 when cows Half surfactant given to human babies um, what was was shown to prevent the respiratory distress syndrome. So, have you guys heard of clinical studies? Probably, right? Um, lots of times, college students are asked to volunteer to, to participate in clinical studies, and you sometimes get paid for that. So that's a case. So if you were a baby born in 1985 and you were eight weeks or more premature, your parents would have, could have been asked to enroll you into a clinical study to see if this works. So today, um, less, less than, you know, less than a thousand babies uh, born every year um, are suffering from, from RDS uh, or die from RV, RDS. So that's a big reduction from 10,000 to 1,000 and hopefully that will continue to decrease. So what do you think about this? Animal research benefits animals too. Think that's true? How many of you have pets? Some of you? Yeah. So yeah, big, big one. And we talked about vaccines, right? Vaccines, and, and we heard it in an introduction. That's a big, big reason why our pets are healthy and that they're living longer. And everybody who has a pet knows the worst thing about having a pet is when, you know, they die, right? We like to them, them be with us as long as they can. So, so this is a big advancement for, for lots of us, especially of us who have dogs. Uh, canine parvovirus is a really devastating disease and it's still around today. So if you do have dogs and cats, vaccines are just as important for them as it is for us. Um, canine parvovirus, we still see it um, in dogs that aren't um, vaccinated. I used to work in a private uh, veterinary clinic and um, these puppies, they're usually puppies, you know, they would come in so adorable, go up to isolation, and a lot of times wouldn't come out. 
so what you're seeing there um, is, uh, is actually bloody diarrhea um, and vomiting. So what happens is parvovirus actually attacks the, the gastrointestinal tract, and, and that's just that lining of the intestine just coming off. And then what happens is it opens up the body to allow bacteria in, the, the animals become septicemic, and then die. So today, in 1978, when it, when it emerged, about 91% of the dogs that got it died. Today, that number is lower because we have a lot of advanced supportive treatment, but there's still a lot of dogs that die from it. But thanks to um, work that was already being done uh, for cat parvovirus, scientists were able to develop a vaccine in just one year. So science builds on itself, right? So, um, you know, the, the knowledge that we're learning today will help us, you know, tomorrow. And that's really important to know. And, and it's really important in biomedical research because it allows us to get the treatments and cures that we need for people and animals that need it sooner rather than later. Um, so it takes a long time for this stuff to, to, you know, get to us. We saw in the first example in 1972, they, were, they learned that surfactant therapy was beneficial in animals, and it didn't take until 1985 till they were starting to show, be able to use it in humans and help humans and, and even pass that before it became a regular treatment. So it takes at least 10 years from a discovery to the patient, but usually it could be more than that, 20 years, 30 years. I've talked to scientists that have been working on something for 40 years. So, um, you know, until it's actually made a difference for people and animals. So lots of dedication um, to helping people in that field. And this is another really interesting um, animal story I wanted to share with you. Uh, so Briard dogs, does anybody have a Briard dog at home? Okay, so they're, they're prone to a genetic form of blindness. It's a, it's a type of uh, severe retinal degeneration uh, kind of disease. So they were using these dogs at the University of Pennsylvania to try to understand what was causing this to see if they could use gene therapy to reverse it and allow these dogs to, to see. And it worked. These, you know, they, 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 they actually were studying three different kinds of severe uh, retinal degeneration diseases and, and they, you know, they're exploring, they're finding that there's, there's a very initial trigger that's causing all these very different kinds of diseases. So they, they had success, uh, Lancelot um, had the disease, he, he was, uh, they, they, they used gene therapy to correct it and he could see. So that's him visiting the White House, um, you know, which is pretty cool. Well they've actually been able to now transfer this technology and this knowledge to humans and, and they're finding that the younger the human is, uh, the, the better it works. So they've had some success in a, in a six year old girl. and and hopefully that will continue. So that's amazing, really amazing, uh, to reverse blindness uh, like that. It started to help a dog, and now it's helping people. Okay, so does anybody have any um, questions about some of the things that I just shared, about some advancements in biomedical uh, research in those specific stories that I, I shared? Okay. So um, hopefully you have a little bit more, you know, understanding and, and feeling that, you know, how biomedical has affected you and how we live today um, and some others. But it's important that these animals are well cared for, right? I think so. Um, in our society, um, here in our country, we, we have, um, we think very, you know, human life is, is sort of pretty high for us, but, but animals are, have a pretty important role in our lives too. And what we find when we're talking to people um, in public opinion and, and how people are, are, are thinking about animals and research, we find that uh, people are concerned. So, but people don't realize how much they're regulated. So that statement up there says, animal research is regulated more strictly than research performed with human beings. Can it be true? Yeah? Okay, why do you think it might be true? Because the animals can't speak for themselves. Of the lesser. Right, because animals can't speak for themselves. And that's what a lot of people say. Do, do others agree? Does anybody think human research is regulated more than animal research? Yeah, it could be argued because those people that do clinical research with humans have to fill out a lot of paperwork and cross a lot of T's and dot a lot of I's, so it is a big process. But it also could, if you put them side by side, you could argue that animals are, are more highly re, um, are more strictly researched. We know it's not less, that's for sure. 
Um, there's a lot of things involved in being able to have the privilege to use the animals in research. So um, I'm just going to, we won't go through all this, but I want you to be aware of some of these laws that are out there. So the Animal Welfare Act is, is one law, and as we mentioned it earlier, passed in 1966, and has been amended several times um, since 1985. Um, and the Public Health Service Policy, and that one is a policy that's required for any institution that uses any government funding in, in their research, which is most of them. Um, and that covers all vertebrate, vertebrate animals. So these things tell you everything from how the animals need to be housed, what the temperature needs to be, what the lighting needs to be, how people need to be trained, and so on and so on and so on. So we'll go through a couple details. Um, the U.S. also has a government principles that, that all these laws sort of comply with as well. And it says things like animals must not, um, you know, pain and distress must be alleviated, uh, people must be trained, um, analgesics needs to be used, things like that. So you can look all that stuff online, uh, up online. And if you work in, uh, in research with the animals, you become a lot more familiar with, with the laws. Does anybody um, need animals now in research or anybody, or any of you using animals? Or? Okay. Um, and then the guide. Now, this is not a law, but the PHS policy says we must, uh, you know, use it as a guide. And this thing is pretty thick, and it has everything you ever needed to know about all different species on, on how to properly house and care for them in research. So, um, one of the big things, this thing was just re revised, and um, one of the stresses now really is, is even a higher standard of care in regards to enrichment. So any animal that is a social animal needs to be socially housed. So like mice, like each other, so they need to, you can't just have one mouse in a cage, um, especially non-human primates. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit later about how we provide the good care for the animals, but dogs, you know, dogs love people, so human interaction needs to be part of their program, things like that. Um, this is the part I wanna highlight out of those laws all, and policies. All of them say that you must, any, institution that, that need animals and research must have an IACUC. And the IACUC is an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, and they're made up of a group of people on, on site, and they're the ones that review every single protocol. So if a scientist needs an animal and research, they need to fill out a very, very long form um, that sort of addresses all different things that, that are required. How many animals are they going to use? Is it scientifically justified? what's going to happen to the animal, all that kind of stuff. And it goes to this committee and they either approve it or not approve it. So you can't just walk in and use animals, it has to go through a process. Um, and they also inspect all the animal areas, the housing areas, as well as the areas where the animals will be, will be used in scientific work and things like that. So on this IACUC, can't just be anybody at the institution either, there has to be a veterinarian on there to look out for the animal welfare. Um, and there has to be a community member. So somebody from outside of the institution um, that has nothing to do with the institution to make sure that the public sort of perspective is in there too. And they all have equal voices. And then, and then you know, in most cases there's a scientist on there, a non-scientist, um, that kind of thing. So they're really big important of the process. Um, another thing that these, uh, this group is responsible for and what every institution has to have when they're needing animals and, and research or, or teaching is something called a whistleblower policy and it's exactly what it sounds like. So there has to be a method where people, anybody, can report anything that's happening with animals that they feel is inappropriate. Um, and you could do it and tell, you give your name or you can do it anonymously and that's really important. So if you ever go through a research facility, you'll, you'll probably see signs on the wall with the whistleblower policy, how to get a hold of people and report animals. And that's just another way to make sure that they are protected. Um, and the three R's is sort of what's integrated into all of this with what guides every scientist, um, all work that happens with the animals. So I'll just go through them. These are our three R's. There's lots of R's out there in the world now with it, a days. You reuse, recycle, and something else, but that's not this three R's. These are different. Um, this is refinement, replacement, and reduction. So um, we're always thinking about refinement. How can we better house the animals? You would think we would know everything we need to know these days, but we still don't. 
Do you know there was a time where the world thought that, that animals didn't feel pain? You know what I mean? We've come a long way since then. So refinement is when you're always, you're using pain medicine when, when, when you're able to. You're refining living conditions for the animals. So learning about the behavior and creating the best environments for them. Training the people who take care of them. Replacement. As I said earlier, animals are not allowed to be used unless they're absolutely necessary and it's scientifically justified. So, um, you know, finding ways uh, to replace the animals. So, if there's anybody in the audience who would prefer us not use animals in research, but understand the importance of biomedical research, dedicate your life to developing alternatives. That would be great. Um, it's tough because we, we cannot simulate a, a complete living being today yet. Uh, but there's in vitro testing that happens, uh, imaging, oh, what a great, um, you know, what a great advancement. We can now look at human brains and see a lot more than looking at a rat brain. We still need to use rat brains for some things, but you can use a lots of, lots of um, imaging. Imaging ha actually helped us reduce animal numbers as well. So instead of having to euthanize animals and open them up to measure tumors or whatever, you can now just image the animals, and it, it's, a, it's better science. Um, computer modeling and then microdosing allows us to get things into people earlier, safer, um, and use less animals. And then reduction. So statistics, some of you might be in, in a statistics class. Big, big, big importance in research. Um, you know, part of the process is justifying your numbers. Uh, lots of times statisticians are on IACOOKS to help with that. But um, just making sure that your experimental designs are appropriate, you know, that you're using the right numbers. And um, there's some methods that allow multiple procedures on, on animals as long as it's humane, you know, that kind of thing. And then veterinary care, another very important part of the law. Do you have a question? Yeah, I don't know. Why aren't um, animals for research treated better than the animals we eat? Like, I know ultimately they're going to die, but they're like, like from birth to that is pretty hard. Yeah, you're right. Um, because there's more regulation that protects animals and research than that, than our food animals. Yeah, um, and there's a lot of work going to try to improve the welfare for food food animals because our society cares a lot more than we used to. So good question. Cost, and that was my next thing. Awesome. So yeah, so cost. If if our food animals were more highly regulated that our food would cost more as well. So it's tough, you know what I mean? But I think with, you know, pressure, you, you, if you do your research, you will find that the standards for food animals are, are much higher than they used to be. Did, did, is that what you were talking about in the cost? Yeah, so we need to be able to afford our food. Yeah. Um, and because of cost, so cost for research is going up too, which means less research is happening. Um, which scares me. So those of you, we all vote, right? Make sure you're, you're keeping your eyes out and you're voting for those who are, are helping us, um, you know, be fiscally responsible and have the money to continue the research because it is expensive. Um, and the additional regulations make it more expensive. Um, veterinary care is required. So these guys get great veterinary care. That was actually the thing that pulled me in the research. I was a veterinary technician, I um, was dedicating my life to taking care of animals. I got into research by accident as part of an internship, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm here to take care of animals, what am I doing in research? My very first day, completely fell in love. I could not believe how well the animals were cared for, how much of a difference I could make, and I just spent my, the rest of my career in research. So they do um, require veterinary care, and, and they get the state of the art, you know, best stuff that, th that they need, which is pretty um, which is pretty great. And if you are interested in animals and veterinary care, I'm just going to side note, great place to, to have a career um, if you want a variety of animals. We don't have these animals I'm showing on the screen, that's sort of just to prove a point, but lots of animals from you know mice to, to monkeys, so lots of different variety uh, to take care of as well. And then laboratory animal care. So, so here, uh, this is sort of the part I'd like to finish up with because I really want you to, 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 you know, if you walk away with nothing else, do know that a lot of effort is spent on their care. Um, not only because it's the right thing to do, not only because it's a law, but because people dedicate their lives to, um, 
taking care of these guys. You know, it's what their passion is, and it's good science. So um, this is uh, an example. Now this is sort of an over example because I wanted to show you a few things. But um, can anybody see what animal might be in that enclosure? You can see it. Sometimes people can't see it. There's a little mouse up there. See, he's right there. And so, so what he has in here, uh, the, the cages are, you know, in, include things that allow a mouse to be a mouse, okay? So when we think of a mouse behavior, we know mice like to burrow, right? So there's bedding there so they can burrow in the bedding. You can see that there's some nesting material here. Anybody ever find a mouse in your attic or basement or something like that? They usually have a nest, right? They love to make nests. And just, um, you know, just so you know, the way we're always advancing our knowledge to make sure that these guys have better lives it's just been found that mice actually prefer two different kinds of material to make their nests. They like a soft inner and like a harder outer. So now research is usually ahead of the curve on this. So you, you are now finding facilities are not, not only just putting one type of material in there for making a nest, but they're putting two, you know, because the mice like the better. Um, and then there's logs in there. They like to gnaw. Their teeth grow throughout their lives, so they can gnaw on that stuff. And then you can see there's some shelter in there because they really like to hide. Um, so, so that's sort of an example of how we make that, that enclosure good for a mouse. Um, this is a pig. Pigs are used in research as well. One of the behaviors that pigs do is something called rooting, where they push things around with their nose, right? Um, you know, so these balls are put in their enclosure, so they, they push them around. Sometimes they're big balls. Sometimes they, they'll, you know, in some cases, animals will go to play areas for part of the day where they can have sort of a more enriching environment. So they might go to a room that has a hard floor with bedding and you hide treats under the bedding and they push it around and they find their bedding, things like that. So, um, because that's what pigs like to do. Lots of people say pigs like to roll in the mud. I don't know of a facility that lets them roll in the mud, but, um, they probably would like that, you're right. So we do as much as we can, but there's some things that, that, that aren't possible. And then I mentioned um, earlier, dogs love people, right? So part of their um, you know, enrichment is interaction with people. I mean, this is part of her job, hang out with the dogs. Um, they, they get to get out and play, we give them toys, and they also like to be together. So that's a, that's a lot of things that are involved with, with um, taking care of dogs. So good science and animal welfare go hand in hand, or in our case, hand in paw. Um, hopefully you learned a, few, a little bit today. We have uh, 15 minutes left, so we can have a question and answer period. So I'll just pause and, and open it up. Yes? Um, where, you mentioned that they have like, a community member, of that, like a veterinarian, and like, multiple different people. Where do they get their team of people? Well, the veterinarian is somebody who works at the institution. The community member is always the hardest person to find. You know what I mean? So, so somebody might know a neighbor or that they'll contact PSBR because we, we interact with a lot of teachers. So sometimes we'll find a teacher who's interested in going. The community members are hard because you've got to make sure they don't have any official relationship, but you need somebody to know that they need one and go out and get one. So there's some uh, state associations like mine that help find community members and then lots of people on IACUX will know, you know, a friend of a friend who, who's available and interested. Yeah. But everybody else is actually from the institution. Yes. So if animals are bred for research, how do you get out and else having two Okay, so uh, the animals are bred for research, but then you're... So, I mean, everyone's wild to read an article or something. So if they were bred for research, then whatever animal they had, that might be Yes, yes. Yeah, so most of the animals, um, we actually induce the disease in, in the animal. Um, although a lot of the, like the tumor cells, they're actually injected with them and then they grow. Um, with, um, but there's other models that where they are born with the disease and they just develop it over time. Or some of them are, are created to be able to develop a disease but then you can turn it on somehow, it's whatever it is. It's, it's amazing stuff. Where, where if you want them to express the disease, you might have to feed them a certain diet or something like that. And then they have the disease and the scientists could study from there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just curious how that, how that worked. 
Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's really crazy if you ever like think you know do a little research, of, especially at one of the um, companies that breed mice, for example, to see all the different kinds of mice. You think a mouse is a mouse is a mouse, and they're not. You know, um, they're they're really bred for specific types of diseases, research, you know, things that they're looking for. So, but, um, and then once they get to the place, then usually the disease in, is in, induced somehow. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a figure for the mortality rate of test subjects? Is there a figure for the mortality rate of test subjects? Well, most of the, I'll try to answer that and you let me know if I answered your question, okay? Most of the animals that are needed in research are euthanized. So because um, in most cases you need to look at the data from, look at the animal from a cellular level. So you're gonna have to take out test, take out tissues and do additional testing. Um, there are some cases where that's not necessary. Um, so they can be adopted out. You know, for example, I've adopted a dog and friends have adopted cats and ferrets. I have birds and guinea pigs, you know what I mean? So if, if that's not needed, they can be adopted out. But in most cases, they're euthanized. Um, all research must, in their protocol, has to have an endpoint so that the animals aren't just left to die. You know what I mean? There has to be an endpoint where, if you're studying a progression of a disease, and you know that there's a point where this is not going to either the, the therapy's not working, or you understand what's happening, and then the animals euthanize, so it's, it's as human as possible. Did that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Please take advantage. Careers of biomedical research. So, I'm an engineering major. Okay. And, um, biomedical or bioengineering is the general course of research. Nice. Most engineers here yes. are the same. But that doesn't necessarily entail. Like, do you have any kind of figures of what of like the four major groups, like the kind of and how they apply to biomedical research, or what kind of I just know, I've actually just met two biomedical engineers in the last two weeks, you know what I mean? Because uh, medical devices is a big, big growing area. Um, I don't know. Maybe you give you some background on what I was asking. I was talking to a professor of mine, and he taught electrical and biomedical portion. And just, that's what I was kind of asking questions about those two majors. And he, he basically said all his research projects he had going on students that have had a background in something like electrical are more useful. That's one of the final engineering degree. But when I for another class was doing research on job opportunities, it seems anything that's advertising a biomedical type of job is looking for a biology or chemistry. Um, I don't know if there's any kind of crossover between kind of witness from the Yeah, so no, 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 that's a okay. Um, I do so you're saying people who are looking for biomedical... So what, what opportunities are there in biomedical for, say, electrical or mechanical or other type of discipline? Is there, is there a need for that? I think there is. But I could probably, if I get your, give you my card or get your email, I could probably email you, you know, do some research and, with some colleagues and get, get you a better answer to that. And that's, um, I'm not an expert on this, but one would think that biomedical engineering would be important in the role of using animals in research. I lived most of my life in California near a university similar to Westchester called California State University Northridge. And they partnered with a biomedical engineering company called Medtronics that used animals for research in insulin pumps. And I don't know what animals they use, but they're now using it in human beings where if someone has diabetes, instead of injecting themselves with insulin if it's type 1 or taking meds if it's type 2, they have a pump implanted and you don't have to take the meds, the, the pump actually pumps your daily dose of insulin for you. So that was done with biomedical engineering and animal research. Yeah, there's a ton of biomedical engineering. So I think I was just talking to the biomedical engineer I was talking to the other day. He started out as an electrical engineer, but he really liked the life sciences. So somehow in his educational career, he was able and he was able to sort of combine the two. And then he's now Oh, and also a, a friend, I don't know what animals, again, they used, but in 
implanting a, 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 an electrical engineering device to control Parkinson's disease. And it worked for a while on him as well. So, I mean, research is going on in that area. Because it's a dopamine email, problem. So I can send you, I'll actually connect you with somebody who think you like that. Yes? Well, we have, um, we have volunteer opportunities if you'd like to talk to, to high school students about having a science career. Or, or, or education, but we also do, um, you know, we do try to find, you know, people, so, students like yourself sometimes contact us about internship opportunities, and our members are uh, pharmaceutical companies, academic institutions, and, and others that support biomedical research, so we'll send your, your name out or your resume out or whatever to find out or connect you with other internship opportunities when we can. Yeah, so I can give you my card or you can leave me your email and we can connect that way. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Pinterest. So if you want to just connect with us, as, you know, just learn more about the topic to see different opportunities out there. Connect with us in one of those ways, um, and it sort of, you know, pr provides. And that's a way yeah, you can get in touch with me too if you want some of those connections. Um, what kind of degrees? I guess it's kind of like a question. Of, what kind of degrees do the biomedical research like careers? Yeah, so that's a good question, and I wish I brought my uh, handouts. Actually, I do have them in the car, so I'll leave them with, uh, can I leave them with you? And sure. then, yeah, and then maybe you could get them from the office. But anyway, so I don't know why I did that. There's a lot all over the place. So there's a lot of different levels in biomedical research, everything from animal care all the way up to, you know, PhD and MD kind of a thing. So you could start out with just a high school diploma. You could have a biology degree. You could have chemistry, you know, degree, uh, animal science, um, uh, any any higher education degree actually from associates on up could get you as research technician. Um, there's a lot of different areas. Um, I'll leave the brochures outside my office 2414 starting tomorrow in a large um, envelope tacked outside my office 2414. Any other questions? Yes. To be a scientist, you have to go through sort of a psychological. Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe they, sh maybe we should sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of facilities you do have to go through a background check. You know, you have to make sure you know criminal history and things like that. Um, lots of states are getting more strict or trying to get more strict on if you've ever been convicted of any sort of animal abuse. You're not allowed to work in biomedical research, but that's all just society trying to protect the animals. I'm, I meant like as you're going working with the animals, you have attachment. Oh yeah, we definitely get attached. So, like, Sometimes. So there are there there is support out there if you're having issues with grieving and things like that. Um, a lot of most of us that go into animal related industries, whether it's with the animals and research or otherwise, sort of have to, yeah, learn learn that because we do get attached, we do cry, you know, sometimes because they are they have names, you know what I mean? We see them every day, so there there is some support um, for that if, if it's needed. Yeah, good question. Anyway, let's uh, thank Paula. Please um, tell your peers that the talk will be repeated at 5 o'clock for those who couldn't make it. If you didn't sign the roster, it's right up here. And thank you all for attending.